So what I wanted to show everybody today is really kind of my cornerstone presentation that I give to everybody. I work exclusively, but a, a ton with real estate investors. And I think that probably everybody here has had a client that will say something like, well, I prefer to invest in real estate or they're making their money somehow. They're making their money in their business, in real estate, in stock options, in RSPs, or some, somehow saving their money and making money. So I just wanted to go over my Better Built Plan presentation. So I start off by explaining to people that they have two problems and they're probably not even aware of them and that most financial planners are not even talking to their clients about these two problems unless they're moments away from retiring. And that is the safe withdrawal rate risk and the sequence of return rate risk. And both these things affect your probability of running out of money. So what I like to do with clients is present at the power of two solution, which is using real estate, but it could be something else. It could be stock options, it could be the business, but real estate with cash value insurance. Can everybody hear me okay? Is it going okay? Yep. Okay, perfect. If you do, so, if, you do uh, if you do get lost here, oh, Kathleen, okay. just come back in. I'll carry it while you're gone, but then just come back in, okay? Okay. Okay. So most financial planners are focused on what I call accumulation theory. They say things like invest in RSPs, it'll compound over time, save in your TFSA, make regular contributions. But this isn't what financial institutions do. Financial institutions use what we call economic theory or money in motion. They will uh, raise funds, borrow, um, invest in businesses. Also, when you get to the top of the mountain and you're ready to retire, nobody's explaining to people how you're going to take that money out and the problems that can happen. So what we use, we, and this is sort of came from my LEAP background, because LEAP stands for Lifetime Economic Acceleration Process, is we use economic theory or money in motion. So what I like to do with clients, I, I love to show them how they can borrow against their home and get an income property. And then they can use the rental income property to fund a whole life uh, insurance policy. And now they've got their principal residence, they've got an income property, which is providing cash flow, mortgage, pay down appreciation. And then now they've got a whole life policy. And then, you know, fast forward that even a year or two, if real estate is continues to do well, then they've got access to even more funds. So that's sort of what we focus on in the money in motion. I tell people, go ahead and Google the safe withdrawal rate. And they will see that the safe withdrawal rate is really only four, four and a half percent. In fact, it's probably lower, maybe closer to 3%. Well, what is the safe withdrawal rate? This is the method proven empirically that helps to guide retirees as to what they can withdraw from their wealth when they get to retirement in a, in a 65 age graph. Yeah. Why is it so low? Because most people think, you know, I'm probably going to make around 8% a year. So why can't I be accessing 8% of my money? Why is it close to 3 or 4%? And these are the things I focus on. The first thing is market volatility. And I have some slides at the end of this presentation, which I can go over later as well if I have time. But market volatility absolutely screws you in retirement. If you have, say, like a million dollars and you're taking out 10% of your money every year, which is 100,000, and you have a 2008 crash or a 2020, let's say your, your portfolio is worth half, you still need that 100,000 to live off of. But now that 100,000 went from 10% of your money to 20% of your money. And I'm using these extreme and simple numbers to kind of get across the problem. But in if you have bad years in the first couple of even the first decade in retirement, when you take out more than you earn, you will encroach on capital. You know, during your accumulation years, it's fine. You can be paid to wait. The markets will rebound. In fact, you can buy more lower. But when you're in retirement and taking that money out, you, you don't have any choice. You start to encroach on capital. The second thing is a proportion of safe money. 
Now, I am old enough to, to remember when the guideline was, whatever your age was, was how much you would have in GICs. So if you were 60, 60% 60 of your money would be in bonds, safe money, GICs. Now, the, like the 10 year, the a 10 year government bond is earning less than 1.5% right now. So just to make math simple, let's assume GICs are earning nothing. So if your equity is earning eight and your safe money is earning zero and you're 50, 50, you can see how your average rate of return might be close to 4%. But what do we do as financial planners? Like, it, it's not really um, ethical or advisable to put a 60 year old in 100% equity, but yet the bonds are earning nothing and if interest rates rise, they'll actually be quite risky in terms of losing money. And that's where the whole life will come in. The other thing is inflation. You know, I always talk about inflation, um, but right now it's, it's top of mind. People, People know, like, like we were just looking at, at like the truck we bought for sixty five is now ninety thousand, right? Um, the cost of bread, the cost of housing, the cost of your utility bills, the cost of medical advances. We also talk about additional expenses. When I was a kid, there was one TV in the house, there was one car, there was one telephone. There are so many expenses now that we didn't even have back then. We didn't have 401 charges. We didn't pay OHIP um, fees in our tax returns. We didn't have internet. Uh, we didn't have Amazon Prime. There's millions and millions of things. And just like we couldn't fathom what would come in our future, we can't fathom what will happen in the, ne in the next 20 years. All I know is, is that our lifestyle goes up. You will never be able to buy a car with crank windows again. The a vehicle will only get better and better, right? And then there's the life expectancy, which is a key discussion. You know, if life expectancy is, let's say, 85, that means half the people live to 85, but half live beyond. So if we're sitting down here and planning with a couple that's 60, 65, we don't we can't just say plan to 85 because there's a 50% chance that their plan will blow up. And so when, when they're planning, they're like, they don't know how long they're going to live. So do they plan for a hundred, which means they take out a little bit of money, less money, or they plan for 85 and they have to plan for the hundred, which is again, why that safe withdrawal rate is so low. So I focus a lot on this slide. So what I'm trying to do with clients is build a better plan. The safe withdrawal rate, that three to 4% is really no plan at all. In fact, if we have some bad, a lot of bad years in the first five years, we would have to readjust it. However, we can save the plan and especially if we put the solution in place now. There's no point in putting the solution in place at 65 because it just won't have enough time to grow. So what we do is we say, if we can, Put together a plan that would create a world that we estimate 25 to 100 percent more income than your current plan and less risk of running out of money would that be something that you're interested in and the answer is yes i usually describe that right now they are on the path of the asset only solution so for every million dollars that they accumulate before retirement it's going to be able to produce them around 40,000 a year. However, what I do is I put an asset protection plan in place and I use a tool. Uh, I've heard it described as a widget as well. Now we, for every million dollar in this path, we might only get to 800 in this path, but in this route, we can create a world where we are, let's say, living off of 10% of our money, which is 80,000. So we've been able to, with less money, create a world that has twice the income. And how can we do that? Well, it's this widget, because this widget, which is life insurance, this tool, will replace or restore your money if something bad happens. So life insurance is really just the tool. It's part of the planning method. But if it's not there, then you're going to have a problem. You have to envision your life in retirement with insurance and without. You know, with insurance, you can take advantage of 
opportunities to maximize your income. Uh, a couple might say, you know, I'd love to take the, the family, the kids, the grandkids on a trip to Hawaii. Uh, and the other spouse is saying, well, I don't think we should spend that because if something happens, then I'm, I'm left with considerably less money. But that won't be true if they have life insurance. So understand how the death benefit can can work for them. You know, you only technically have access to the cash value in terms of borrowing against it from the cash value. But when you have life insurance, you can spend down other assets. So for instance, you might feel completely comfortable getting a reverse mortgage on your principal residence because you have life insurance to back it up. So if you wanted to give money to kids or you want to leave your spouse with some money if something happens, you can do that. So it creates a greater, uh, a greater income. Asset protection, and this is where I get into the power of two. We want assets, but we want to protect them. I have a big conversation about, you know, like in the 80s, most people's money, uh, retirement money would have been in defined benefit pension plans, but they don't exist. Now, unless they are a teacher, firefighter, police officer with a defined benefit plan or government worker, I say, you know, like if you're a teacher and you live too long, that's okay because the teacher's pension will last as long as you do. If you're a teacher and the stock market crashes, that's okay because the pension plan is on the hook, but that's not you and that's not me. And even, even teachers or police officers or firefighters will typically have significant assets outside of their pension plan. Or if they have kids or beneficiary needs, then, you know, if they pass away, the pension money is gone if they don't have a, like a, a spouse remaining. Whereas with the wealth insurance, they have some options. So we are trying to protect our assets. So we wanna grow the assets, yes, but we also wanna protect them. You know, people, it makes sense for people when they're young that they would buy insurance to replace their income if, some, if, if they had a, a premature death. And then they think in retirement, they don't need it. But really, what is your income in retirement? It's your assets. So you still, you still need that income. So we want to protect the assets. So this is, again, that combination. So right now, you are on the one strategy solution. So for every million dollars, maybe you can get a 4,000 a year income, but it's not guaranteed, as I mentioned. If you suffer from volatility, then it might have to be reduced. What we wanna do with you is offer you a better built plan, which has retirement assets, yes. And I'm not just talking RSPs here, I'm talking everything. Um, RSPs, TFSAs, businesses, real estate portfolios, everything. But we're also going to have permanent cash value insurance. So in this world, if you run into trouble, you can go to the insurance policy. And when I try and figure out how much insurance I want for them, I'm trying to give them a three to four year insurance buffer. Sorry, cash value buffer in their insurance. So in this world, so let's say as, as a real estate investor, my plan was to um, refinance my property in the second year. Well, if the mortgage rules change and I'm not able to do that, that's okay. I can go to the cash values in my insurance policy. If my plan was to sell off one of my properties and the real estate market happens to be depressed, that's okay, I can go to my insurance policies. And likewise, if the stock market is in the crap or, or interest rates are uh, super, super low or super high, so, or if, if my spouse has a, a critical illness and I need to uh, spend money and divert my attention, I can go to my insurance policies to live. And in fact, I do not need to have safe money elsewhere if I have enough safe money in my insurance policy. 
So I could actually invest more of my money in real estate in stocks than someone that doesn't have insurance because that's my safe money. And in fact, the insurance policy, I always say, I can't tell you what return you're going to get on your insurance policy because you can't tell me when you're going to die. But the after tax, like the, 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 the tax equivalent at life expectancy is typically in the six to eight percent range, at, which is amazing considering GICs are less than two percent right now. But the other thing is, is that um, it, it's, and I'll, I'll get into this later, but it's not the return on the policy that's in, important or the cash value that's important. Because if I ask you what type of return you got on your house, and we looked at how we put our money in motion, it's infinitesimal, right? Because we borrowed against our house to buy an income property, and that's grown up. That's exploded. Um, so if we use our policy for wealth building, then the return will be even greater than what we show. So I usually take a little bit of a break at this point and I say to people, so what I've done so far is explain to you how insurance saves your retirement, right? I've shown you that you can have significantly greater income with the same asset base if you follow the insurance. But you, like most of my clients, don't find life insurance exciting and sexy. Not like me. I, the, you want to invest in properties. You want to buy stocks. You want to trade options. You want to do private mortgages. You want to invest in your business. And I get that. The beauty of the wealth insurance, if it's well structured, is you don't have to choose between insurance and saving your retirement and those other opportunities. You have access to this money. And that's what really drew me to the infinite banking. After I had some conversations with Scott, I was really drawn to it. I used to, I initially started with Leap and I loved Leap and it was great, but I was always using the policy cash values to buy more properties or to invest. And that's why the infinite banking really resonated with me because it has a much larger focus on the the cash values and uh, building up uh, strong cash values early, like as in building up your bank. So uh, this is just an example of a policy that I illustrated this week. Um, Jeff Mitchell, 52, uh, we did, uh, sort of 20% insurance in a paid up, uh, sorry, sorry, a cash value whole life and 800, so 80% in a term 20. What the term 20 does when you add the term writer with a man you life, especially, is it frees up a ton of cash value. So what we are doing is we're dumping a ton of extra money into the policy to build up that cash value, to build up that, I call it like a, a mega line of credit. And this is sort of the, the, first the first part of the illustration. And I'll explain to people that we're putting in 20,000. Now in the first year, you only have, let's say, access to 90% of this column. And so you don't get dollar for dollar. There's definitely a little bit of delayed satisfaction but you can see, you know, by year 10, you put in 200 and you have 90% of the 175 and your insurance value has grown. So with me, I'm not trying to lock people out of their money, which is not something that you can do uh, with UL. And we illustrated it for 20 year, the base policy continues. I show people this slide and I will personalize this slide for them. So 53 year old male, 20,000 a year, 1 million of insurance. And we can see, for instance, that at the 10 year mark, and you don't have to wait to the 10 year mark, but as an example, at the 10 year mark, you can get a loan against the policy. It could be a policy loan with the insurance company, which is typically the preferred way for my real estate investors. And the beauty of it for them, because they've got a lot of mortgages, is no credit check, no application, 
It's just a form to fill out. The money is usually in your bank account within a week, and it's a contractual obligation that the insurance company must provide. So what I want my clients to do is I want them to borrow as much as possible against their policies and against their homes for wealth building strategies in their wealth building years. So all about good debt. My logo is is a, a puzzle piece, uh, which I'll show you later. But what I think makes me different is I focus on using good debt. I'm not a pay off your debt person. I highly recommend income properties, which my clients find extremely refreshing because most advisors will not do that because they have no way of making money off of it. And then that's the, the wealth insurance. And many clients, although it's starting to catch on, but many clients are like, why hasn't anybody talked to me about this? Even if they have whole life policies from years gone by, they don't tend to have the early cash value ones. Or they'll have the ones that have death benefits that are, are, are level. So, but I really want them to borrow for wealth building strategies. And I'll show them an example of either dying at their life expectancy or lit or what happens if they're alive at their life expectancy. So here we can see that maybe we continue to borrow against the policy. Maybe we bought a house for 750 and we've never paid off that debt. We've 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 borrowed from the policy to pay off the mortgage. If they were to die at 87, the life insurance would be worth 1.3 minus what they've already borrowed. But you have to remember that this money was not borrowed for a vacation or a car that's gone now. It was borrowed for a wealth asset. And so maybe that income property is now worth 3 million and shooting off 50,000 a year of cash flow. We forward it that that far. And so your beneficiaries would still have this um, and then they would get the remaining from the insurance policy. Conversely, if you're alive at 87 and to be honest, this will happen typically sooner, but most 87 year olds do not want to be managing a stock portfolio, do not want to be managing a real estate portfolio. But when you, when you sell your, what they would do is typically they would sell that property, pay off that loan. And now they're that person B in retirement that has 3 to 4 years of cash value. I'd like to, to be honest, to see you do this closer to 60, 65, but. Sometimes what people will do instead is borrow against the policy and pay off the mortgages on their properties. So their properties, um, cash flow like stink. And yeah, so if you're uh, alive, you probably don't want to be managing the property. And then now you're this, this person with, uh, with, with good cash values that person B. So wealth, wealth insurance gives you the insurance that you need, but we're not locking you out of access to your capital. You know, like when you put money in your RSP, it's an RSP jail. It's, it's not impossible to get out, but if you do, you'll pay a huge tax penalty, which would defeat the purpose. TFSAs are great, but whole life is like a TFSA on steroids, but you can't borrow against your TFSA. You can borrow against your insurance policy much more easily. And if you want to, you know, invest in real estate, business, private mortgages, and you borrow for the wealth strategies, the interest on your on your policy loan will actually be tax deductible as well. You've also got that tax-free growth. And like I've talked a lot about, it's that fixed income replacement. It's an, it's a, it's an asset class. So again, what I'm trying to do is make sure that you are not one of those people that is suffering from that safe withdrawal rate risk, which limits your income and increases your, the chances of you running out of money. So what we want to do is create three to four years of cash value buffer at retirement, provide you the cash that you need it. So in summary, and I've got some other slides here, but the safe withdrawal method is really no plan at all. Permanent insurance can save the plan, can save the retirement, creates a world with greater income with less money. But I'm not locking you out of that money. There's also, if uh, many real estate investors will have um, cold codes for their properties, uh, for their investments. So we can even do that for additional savings. 
I talked a little bit about my logo. I'm just going to cover a little bit more if I have time. The missing pieces of the puzzle. So again, I focus on good debt. I believe, you know, the governments continue to print money and real assets like income properties will typically appreciate as as they print money, it devalues the dollar. So the debt you have is worth less and less and the properties are appreciating more because they are real assets that are going to uh, keep pace with inflation. It's not so much, in my opinion, that real estate is has been skyrocketing is, and is super high. It's that the debt has actually been devaluing. And that's why I firmly believe that savers will be losers in this economy. If, if you if you were somebody like, you know, my father, that Dutch background, you know, pay off your debt, um, you know, don't have any debt. And I'm not talking about credit card debt. I'm talking about having good debt and income properties, income properties, because of the leverage and because you don't pay tax to the end when you sell, like with a, with a non-registered portfolio with mutual funds, you're paying ongoing tax. Uh, you can postpone the capital gains, which is why it's really important to buy properties that you would keep for a very long time. And if you do want to sell it, that you structure when you sell it at, at an opportune time. So, for instance, a low income year when maybe when you first retire and then the wealth insurance, not only for wealth creation, but great opportunity money this year. Uh, we sold one of our properties as a condo. We, uh, my in-laws were in it and they passed away. And I have taken that money and plopped it all back on my policy loans because personally, so I can, from my personal experience, we have bought three properties with our insurance policies. That's the down payment. And we have funded a trading account with our insurance policies. So I definitely walk the walk here. Those three things to me are the missing pieces of the puzzle. I talk about the holy grail of retirement. I don't know if you know this about real estate, but when you have an income property and you, let's say you're, you earn 12,000 a year from it, 20,000 a year, you can depreciate the building to offset the income. So my goal was always to create a world where I had 10,000 a month of income, but paid zero tax on it so I can I create that real estate income, but the ability to depreciate the property, which postpones the tax definitely till when you sell or death, it's not tax free, but I would rather postpone tax than, than pay it now whenever I can. So if I can create tax free income from real estate and tax free income from my insurance policies, that to me is the holy grail of, of retirement income. And that ensures that I am not going to be one of those people that will have my OA, OAS um, clawed back. Clawed back. Um, who knows? Uh, HST, I should qualify for, sorry, GST, qualify for that. Maybe even GIS, I don't know. <laughs> um, I talk a little bit about corporately owned insurance, how they can pay for it with pre-personal tax dollars, if that's relevant. Um, and these are just some final slides. Normally, I would put this in the middle of my presentation. I just didn't want to fart around with the presentation mode because I had a tough time. But here are some great slides to show volatility. This is an example of someone that had a million dollars, invested for 30 years, and took out 10% of the money, 100000 and they earned 14.8%. At the end of 30 years, they were able to get that income every year, and they had $15 million. Now, the reason why I chose 14.8% is that is actually what the S&P 500 earned between 1970 and 1999. But it did not earn that each and every year. So the first year, remember I talked about how the first few years can really affect your ability, um, your, your income moving forward in Croach on Capital. The first year it only earned 4%. Then it earned uh, 14, great year, then two really bad years, two really stellar years. But what did this act what what did this person actually actually end up with? 
So the, in the previous example, it lasted 30 years and they had 15 million. In this example, they're broke by year 15. And that is what market volatility does to people in retirement. But imagine a world where this year you, you didn't have to encroach on your assets. You could go to your insurance policy because you've got three to four years of income buffer. And these slides are just the probability of running out of money. I'll show this as well. So again, most people think that they can take out 8% of the money. If they're in retirement for 35 years, they have a 5% chance of success. Now, if they take out 3% of their money, they have a 95% chance of success. It's never perfect. But as you build in three years of cash value in the policy, four years, five years, you see the numbers crawl up. So with five years, again, it's not perfect, but it's about, I don't know, 78, 80, you know, uh, just under 80% success ratio. So you have so much more uh, success. So really that's sort of the end of my presentation today um, in terms of what I wanted to share with you, but it works great with, uh, with real estate investors. And I don't know, my success ratio is probably 90%. So I wanted to open it up. Kathleen, that was amazing. And uh, as I knew it would be, it's fantastic. And you talk about some things that we generally don't talk about, particularly this last area. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. The chat line is open for everybody. So if you have a question you want to ask Kathleen, throw it in the chat and I'll forward it to Kathleen and or I can take you off mute or you can take yourself off mute. I think in this room, it's, it's our it's our discussion room. So remember that purpose of these webinars and circle of wealth is to is to show you the tools that are available to you and that the deaccumulation phase and illustration piece is available in the circle of wealth software i think one of the reasons kathleen we don't use that as much is because we're not comfortable showing it would you agree no i wouldn't have i wouldn't have known about it um i right. le i learned about it really with leap and the whole conversation about average rates of return versus actual right uh, I build that in. I, I'll often say things like, if you made 100% in one year and negative 50, you end up with the same amount of money, right? 100 bucks would turn to 200, and then it would yep. turn back to 100 bucks. So you made zero in two years, but the average rate of return is 25%, right? right. So right. you have to use actual rates of return. And that's something that the uh, infinite banking people uh, highlight as well. So, right. Yeah. I think that I, it's one of those things where that's again, what sets us apart from most advisors. You know, we talk about things that other advisors will not have talked to you about and shining a light on some of those things is very powerful and very valuable to show the difference between you and every other advisor that's out. You there. have to do that. You have to be different. You have to poke holes yeah. in what I call traditional financial planning rules. Right. Right. Well, that's, it's that line. I think that, you know, I think again, it goes back to one of our, you know, uh, teachers is about living in that world of scarcity. Would you rather live in a world of scarcity or a world of abundance? And I hear other people using that lingo now. So we're starting to get some people out there that are more educated in um, the kind of language that we're using lost opportunity costs, liquidity use and control, you know, access to the cash valve, those kinds of things. And it's nice to see that happening. I'd ask you this question. So are you connected with a real estate organization now? I know you're doing some talks to, you're doing one Tuesday. You just did one this past week at a real estate company. How did that come about? I'm connected to many real estate organizations. I'm very well connected to the Durham one, which is where I live. I would, I would religiously go to every meeting, uh, monthly meeting and networking meeting. And I love it. Cause I mean, I didn't mention this too. Like we're big real estate investors. We have 14 properties. So it's a, it's a wonderful source of information. And for, for them, I was so refreshing because, uh, as a financial planner that also invested in real estate and believed in debt and believed in what they were doing, cause they know that this has returned way more than an RSP is. One of my favorite posts is, uh, how would you feel if what you had invested in your RSP you had invested in real estate? Like what kind of a difference would that have made to your retirement? So, yeah. 
but and then from the Durham one, I've got well connected to an Oakville one. There's a Hamilton one I know a little bit less about. I'm I've been invited to speak to a Peterborough group uh, this week. I'm just very well connected. You're not fighting the real estate now. It's that and asset, you know, that our, our friend right. talks about. It's it is the and asset. We've always talked about it. it's an alternative. You know, the insurance companies talk about it as an alternative asset. And you go, well, wait a minute. It's not an alter it's an alternative asset, but it's an and asset. You shouldn't not have those other things, but you should right. definitely have this and those things, right? It's the yeah, and I'm asset. not locking them out. I'm not saying don't invest in the next property, do this. Right. I'm saying you can do both. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, but, let's uh but you know, I, I just want to say one thing. I am definitely well hooked up with real estate investors, but there's not a single financial planner here that wouldn't have a client or two that invest in property. So this is the approach that they can use with their real estate investors. They can use it with their business owners. Uh, if you have someone that likes to do day trading and stock options, anything. So you all have clients that make money somehow. Um, you, if you, if you like and want to join the real estate group, great, but you can definitely work with people without being super connected to the real estate groups. Well, Kathleen, again, thank you very, very much. Thanks everybody for your participation. This has been awesome. Look forward to more of this. I'll send you an email out on the notification of the next one. I think we'll take a little break for Christmas because you guys are probably all busy going to parties and everything else. So in January, we'll start again. We'll pick up where we left off in that circle. We're talking right now. We're, we're talking about finding the money. We did Mortgage Master, and I wanted to show you this after Mortgage Master because it is someone who's really using the real estate idea effectively. So you've now got this in your toolbox of conversations you can have with people. We'll pick up uh, major capital purchases when we get together next, and we'll continue down this path of finding the money so you can do these kinds of things. Okay, everybody. Thanks very much. Have a great day, Kathleen. Scott, thanks. Happy holidays. See everybody later.